So it's a great privilege to talk about these subjects. This is a new presentation for me. I decided to pull the topics together for this when asked. So I often have an agenda and my agenda today is to introduce a little bit about myself, then talk about energy and then the subject of housing. You know, we all live in buildings. It's an important topic. Uh, may, we may not analyze it that much, but it's an important topic. And then I want to talk about an innovation that we implemented some years ago, and then the outworking of that and developments on, uh, from there, and then put it all together. So that's my presentation. So I mentioned a little bit about context, and uh, Yusin kindly introduced me, uh, but just to add a little bit about this. So I'm a professor, I've been a professor for about 20 years, and I was the founding head of school for the Dyson School of Design Engineering at Imperial. Eight years ago, we had no school and we went from one person to 600 students and staff over a, a quite a short period. And I had the delight of leading that school for six years. And then I had the even better delight of passing that on after six years to Peter Chung, who's, the, who's now the head of school and doing a much better job than I, I managed over the, over the six years, stabilised the school, um, extending and expanding it, raising the quality of all that we do. So that's great. I, like many academics, I have numerous titles. We seem to quite like self-aggrandisement. So I'm professor at large at the Royal College of Art and Imperial College London for the Innovation Design Engineering Programme, which is a double masters. I have the delight of being professor of excellence at MD Ha University in Berlin. And if you don't know MD Ha, it's a multimedia university and responsible for you know, a third or so of filmmakers in Germany. So a fantastic um, institution. From January, for the next five years, I will be co-director of the Energy Futures Lab at Imperial. It's a great privilege to be involved in that. And I've helped advise, for better for worse, over 100 spin-outs from Imperial and the Royal College of Art over the last dozen years. And I try and practice what I preach, and I'm involved with some companies myself, and you'll hear about one or two of these uh, today. And like many academics, I have to do the academic thing, or do do the academic thing, so I write lots of papers and uh, pull together some funding. On the right hand side, you can see some of my designs. Uh, it's something I'm very proud to engage with. So I've done a lot of engine components. I ran a knitwear business doing alpaca knitwear for six years. And I've been involved in various bits of fast moving consumer goods design. And you can see a ventilator that I was involved with on the right hand side. You've heard us mentioned today the Dyson School of Design Engineering, and you can see it on the bottom right hand side. So we managed to buy the corner of the Science Museum off them some years ago. And like all university activities, we aim to produce the innovators, change makers and new knowledge of tomorrow. And we do this through leading edge research and practice in what we call design engineering the fusion of design thinking, engineering thinking and practice within a culture of innovation and enterprise. So that's our mission, vision, activity, if you wish. So I know I'm speaking to people who know the answer to this question, but I decided to pop it in, partly because there's a little bit of a challenge in answering this. So we sometimes say that energy is the ability to do work. We can also say that work is the transfer of energy. I think you'll look at that and you'll go, not a very satisfactory definition. But we seem to have an intuitive understanding of what energy is and the notion that energy can take many different forms from kinetic energy, potential energy, chemical energy, to name but a few. There are many of these. I wanted just to speak to how much energy it takes to do something. So you, I think we all understand that the longer a toaster is on, the more energy it will use. Uh, this is the Nine Lives toaster from the Agency of Design who were thinking about, could you make a 
product that would last nine generations. And you can see their outcome on the right hand side. Very interesting ideas around it. And of course, we can work out the energy used by a particular activity by multiplying the power by time. So if you look on the box for a toaster and discover that it's maybe a 500 watt toaster, then if you're popping it on for two minutes, it's going to use 60,000 joules. You know, uh, the unit of power is watts and one watt is one joule per second. And if you multiply that by the time, you'll get the total number of joules. So about 60,000 joules to toast your bread. Got another one of these here. Not necessarily a product I need a lot of use of, but hey ho, let's see the calculations for this. So once again, uh, the total energy equals the power by the multiplied by the duration of usage. So if you do have lots of hair and you're using a powerful hair dryer, then uh, and running it for five minutes, then it's going to use 2,200 joules per second times 300 seconds for your five minutes, and that's 660,000 joules. It's about 10 times the toaster. No surprise, it's a higher powered unit with both a heater and a fan. But I just thought it was worth looking at these numbers because sometimes you'll calculate things and you'll go, right, I can get 300 joules from uh, this energy store. It's always useful to know how much common usages actually consume. And it's quite easy to calculate these things. The joule and the watt are quite small units. And the more practical measure of energy is the kilowatt hour. And one kilowatt hour is 3.6 million joules or 3.6 megajoules. So uh, you know, 1,000 joules per second times 3,600 seconds, uh, you're 3.6 million joules. And we typically pay for our electricity in kilowatt hours. In the UK, to buy about a kilowatt hour of electricity costs us about 17 pence, typically. We tend to deal with very big numbers when we're looking at electricity usage. So the annual electricity usage in the UK is about 400,000 gigawatt hours. Calculate how much that costs if you were paying 17 pence a kilowatt hour, if you wish. And that equates to an average generation rate of about 46 gigawatts. So big numbers if we're dealing with that. And um, I'm happy to make this uh, presentation available and the organisers uh, can pass it on as appropriate. There's some various links that you might want to check out. So what do we use these big numbers of energy for? Well, transportation, heating, computers and servers, products that we use every day, in fact, just about everything that we do consumes energy in one form or another. And you can calculate these things. You, know, you can calculate the energy associated with sending or posting a, an image on social media and then the consequential energy usage as other people look at this. You can calculate the energy associated with earning some income, you know, earning your 15 pounds an hour. There are methodologies for, for these things. So I've talked about power with units watts or joules per second. I've talked about energy with units joules. I've not talked about carbon emissions yet, but I'm going to in just a moment. You'll know that you'll know this, but I always think it's good just to remind ourselves. The reason why it's difficult to talk about carbon emissions associated with energy is it all depends upon where you're sourcing your power from. If you're sourcing your power from renewables, then it's going to be different to if you're sourcing your power from a combined cycle um, gas turbine engine plant. For many 
fossil fuel plants, the emission of carbon dioxide is about 0 0.000167 grams of carbon dioxide per joule of energy produced. And yeah, there is a justification behind that if you wish to look at that calculation, and it's been repeated many times, much the same numbers come out. So you can calculate the carbon dioxide emission with producing 3.6 3 megajoules of energy a kilowatt hour, comes out about 600 grams of carbon dioxide. And you can also look at converting that, if you wish, to um, carbon. You know, some people like to do their energy audits in terms of carbon dioxide, sometimes in terms of carbon. So you, you need to scrutinise these numbers. So one kilogram of carbon dioxide is equivalent to about 0.27 kilograms of carbon. If you're interested in this type of topic, there's a great free book available from David McKay. And the link is here. You can look it up. Uh, you can download the entire book. He allows it or his estate allows it. Um, it's called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. And I encourage everybody, uh, whether you're from the arts, humanities, medicine, technology, to read this book at some stage in your lives. One of the tables that he's produced in the book is on the right hand side where he's done an audit for the average energy consumption of people in the UK. You know, some of our energy is associated with defence, some transport, some with product, products that we use every day, some associated with food and farming, some associated with light, a big chunk associated with heating and cooling, quite a big chunk associated with jet flights and quite a chunk associated with um, our car usage. So you can see that our usage is not necessarily dominated by any one thing, it's shared across several categories. I mentioned that the carbon dioxide is associated with the production of a joule or a kilowatt hour, it depends upon where you're sourcing your power or energy from. If you're sourcing it from a renewable source, such as a wind turbine, offshore wind turbines, then it's going to be very different to if it's from a combined cycle gas turbine plant. And there are options to us available now. This is a image of the wind farm just off the coast from where I live. I live in Hove near Brighton, and we've got over 100 big wind turbines off our coast. And um, yeah, one of the estimates suggests that we need about 70,000 wind turbines like this to produce all of our power or energy requirements for people living in the UK. And steps are being taken towards getting towards that number. Of course, there are challenges with wind turbines. It's not always windy. The month of August in the UK was very calm indeed, and we had to turn on alternative sources of, of power generation in the UK. I have vested interest associated with wind turbines because one of the companies I'm involved with makes, designs, makes and runs these devices. So this is a picture of a very long wind turbine blade, um, 108 meter long wind turbine blade with a image of <clears throat> Um, one of our robots on the wind turbine blade. Um, this is from the company Bladebug Limited. We're based in London Bridge and produce a hexapod robot which can adhere to the blade surface and walk over the blade surface and undertake inspection, repair and maintenance of these very large offshore wind turbine blades. We've got about four, well, we've got four robots at the moment uh, undertaking all sorts of tasks on blades we don't do moonwalks, we do blade walks, and we get very excited about this. And um, if you're interested, look up Bladebug Limited. But that would be another talk. Today, I said that I would like to talk, in fact, I was asked to talk about Qbot, and Qbot Limited has undertaken a robotic solution and innovation to tackle this challenge. Many of you will have visited the UK or be in the UK, and you'll be familiar with the large housing stock we have associated with Victorian 
Edwardian and 20th century construction. And it's great housing stock. Some of the estimates suggest that terraced houses should have a 600 year design life. In fact, terraced houses can be very desirable and command significant uh, valuations and equity prices. Uh, this is an image of some of the terraced houses where I live. And as I say, these can be very desirable properties and they work incredibly well. The rooms are well sized. People like living in them. People like buying them. One of the challenges with them is making them energy efficient. They date from a different era. They date from an era where you would have a number of um, coal fires within the building and the flows through the building were designed to vent those coal fires. So if you're going to use a different form of heating for your home, then you're going to need to address the uh, fluid flow through the homes. And in fact, these homes and many homes throughout continental Europe, North America, elsewhere in the world, have what's known as an underfloor cavity. So your floor isn't on the ground, there's a air gap between the ground and the floor, makes very good sense. Air is a fantastic thermal insulator, 0 0.025 watts per meter per Kelvin thermal conductivity for air. So if it's quiescent or still, it, it's a really good insulator. We know that because of our, our uh, experience of clothing um, solutions where air is part of the thermal insulation. <coughs> So these cavities exist under many floors in, in our buildings, typically in terraced houses, detached and semi-detached homes, a lot of what we call Prussian housing stock within continental Europe. Not always is it a timber floor, sometimes it's a concrete floor. And indeed in the UK, we have 8 million of these homes with suspended timber floor. And the loss of heat associated with our heating solutions in the UK contributes for a significant proportion of home energy usage. And of course, there's legislation tackling this challenge, encouraging us to have better energy performing homes. But there are other reasons to tackle cold and drafty homes from comfort uh, to the valuation. Just looking at a graphic of the typical heat loss associated with the various features of a home, we typically lose 25% of heat through our roofs, 35% through our walls, 10% through our windows, and 15% through our doors, 15% through the floor. And if you do nothing else, tackle the roof because it's relatively easy to do roof insulation, relatively easy, relatively cheap. You can even do it yourself um, if you've got uh, reasonable skills and you can dramatically reduce heat loss through your roofs. I've said that QBOT tackles floors. It's not the biggest contributor, but it is a significant contributor. So let's look at current measures. I mentioned loft insulation, double glazing, internal wall insulation, external wall insulation, cavity wall insulation, damp proofing, um, sealing, upgrading your boiler, maybe installing a heat pump, underfloor insulation. These are current measures you can undertake in a typical home. If you've got a big cavity and you've got air bricks and you need air bricks in order to vent the cavity to have some through flow of air for timber quality preservation, uh, then you will lose heat from your suspended timber or concrete flooring. The floor loss is more significant than you realise because of the permeability, the lack of air tightness of your building. So air coming up through the floor essentially vents through the gaps in, in the casements for windows, um, pushes air out through the loft. You know, wherever there is a gap, air will permeate or or move through the home. So if you can tackle the floor, you can have multiple benefits. If you tackle the floor, you actually improve your double glazing, you improve your roof insulation, you improve your ceiling. 
the current approach to floor insulation is a bit painful. And that's the justification for a robot solution who we'll get to in the next slide. So what do you do? Well, pick up uh, all of the furniture, remove it from the building, remove the, roll up the carpets, remove any flooring, and then get um, insulation board, chop it up, push it in, and then put the flooring back, put the carpets back, put the furniture back. Bit of a pain. It is the current solution. And that was the innovation space we moved into some years ago. And the idea we came up with, an obvious idea, ideas always are. Why couldn't we use a small robotic vehicle to spray thermal insulation on the underside of the wooden floorboards or, or suspended concrete or timber flooring? And that's exactly what we've done. Challenge, there are challenges in getting into this space, and uh, we've explored all sorts of robotic configurations. You can see uh, a fancy linkage mechanism here, so you can feed the robot in long and thin, you, then, you could then swivel the bogies through 90 degrees, lock them into position in order to form your robot chassis. And uh, we've we're on to you know, Mark 7 robots now. So we've been through several generations of robotics as a mature technology. We're using um, all sorts of technologies in order to survey the space, decide what spray pattern to do, automate aspects of the process. And once you've decided that a property is suitable for spraying, then um, pictured here is our low void robot spraying thermal insulation on the underside of, of the suspended timber flooring. And we can get into very small spaces with these robots. We have a low, vo low void robot and a high void robot, depending on the size of the cavity. So we spray our insulation. Uh, we then validate, is the um, job well done? We've got robot vision, we can check things. And we've been through nine years of development. We've now um, insulated um, of the order of 2,000 homes and en route won an awful lot of innovation prizes, listed some of them here. But we were really proud uh, this year to win, win the Queen's Award for Enterprise. <clears throat> Does it work? Well, there's something called an energy performance certificate um, for buildings. And you want your building to perform well, and there are regimented, standardized methods of defining this. So we installed our insulation, monitored what was going on, and have produced a lot of case studies to justif justify and validate our data. And in fact, because we've now installed insulation on so many homes, we know we probably know more about the underside of buildings than any other company or any other organization. And the outcome for tip, the, the typical outcome um, for our case studies was a very substantive improvement in the energy performance certificate by doing thermal insulation of a building, you can save between 300 and 750 kilograms of, of carbon a year per property. This is a really worthwhile intervention. Because you're putting insulation onto the underside of the flooring, you are dramatically reducing the through flow of air through the home. And you can see the before and after results here for air permeability. Um, a U value is a heat is a um, uni universal, or global, or comprehensive heat transfer coefficient. And again, you can look at the before insulation values here in grey versus the blue post thermal insulation, representing us an over a 70% improvement. This is worthwhile and validation that 
this intervention works, is worthwhile, giving good return on investment. Here's a topic which I suspect is dear to many of your hearts, fuel poverty. In the UK, uh, we're famous for our weather. We actually, yeah, I'm proud of our weather. Uh, I'm very much um, uh, born and bred in the United Kingdom. And I have a particular attitude towards weather. Uh, you, you'll find many British people saying, it doesn't matter what the weather is, provided you've got a good coat. And one of the reasons we say that is in, in you know we're an island. We have Atlantic weather crossing our island probably a number of times on any given day. So we'll have a bit of sunshine, we'll have a bit of wind, we'll have a bit of rain, we'll have a bit of cloud, then a bit more sunshine, maybe a bit more wind and rain. So we may get may we may experience several forms of weather on a given day. That may explain um, one of our one of the almost British characteristics, it's, it's sunny and we rush outside to capture that little bit of sun. But the challenge associated with our weather is dampness and having homes which are, are warm, where the, the heat is uniform within a room is important. If there's a small thermal gradient between, well, it's between your ears and your ankles, of the order of a, a few degrees, say three degrees, you can actually feel pain because of that thermal gradient. The room may actually be quite warm. It might be 24 degrees C, but because your ankles are at 20 degrees C, you may feel very uncomfortable. And actually a top tip for thermal comfort is to ensure uniformity of the thermal gradient or lack of thermal gradient between your ankles and your head in a room. And that can be done, uh, achieved by a small amount of circulation within a room. But of course, uh, people still want to get to a reasonable target temperature for their rooms. And fuel poverty is an issue in the United Kingdom, as well as many other countries. Fuel poverty can take many forms. Your building's too hot or too cold. And a typical answer is good thermal insulation and, and use of thermal mass. So if you are engaged in addressing fuel poverty through social housing, you may well have targets to address fuel poverty. If you're renting a, a property, you can pick and choose. The market in many towns is highly competitive and the customer experience, the place you live, is important to you. And if it's damp and drafty and cold and feels uncomfortable, you, you, you'll, you'll be very keen to move on to the next property. So it's actually in a landlord's interest to provide good thermal comfort. You can command a higher rent, so higher rental income, and you'll have less churn and changeover of people through your properties. I know this is all obvious, but actually, these are drivers for improving the thermal performance of properties. If uh, you have good thermal insulation, then your the, the heating bills will be less, potentially leaving your clients with more money to pay their rental costs, potentially reducing rental arrears. You may well react and wonder, am I being somewhat cynical? But I'm just listing here some of the typical drivers associated with a reason to use technologies like I've just shown from uh, the QBOT company um, using advanced robotics in order to tackle a key societal energy challenge. So, just a few more things to say, and then I will take as many questions as you wish. So space heating accounts for about 60% of home energy usage in the United Kingdom, and it's the largest single contributor to the UK's CO2 emissions. A reason to 
take this challenge seriously. Suspended flooring can account for between 10 and 25% of the heat loss. You know, it's typically of the order of 15%. So it's not insignificant. It's not something that you can just ignore. And an advanced robotic solution has been developed in order to apply thermal insulation to the underside of suspended flooring, be it timber floorboards or a, um, a concrete slab. And we've undertaken enough installations to see a dramatic reduction in the heat transfer for the U value from 0.9 watts per meter squared per Kelvin to of the order of 0.2 watts per meter squared per Kelvin, uh, over a 70% improvement. And you can see uh, a 14% improvement in the space heating requirement for the building concern, buildings concerned. This is worthwhile. And there is a driver in terms of return on investment. What should you do first? Well, I'm going to say do your roofs first, um, but then consider your underfloor insulation as a primary measure. And there are a lot of buildings in Europe alone that need their flooring insulated. So there's potential business here. As you can tell, I'm passionate about this subject. I'm interested in energy. I'm interested in responsible business sustainability. Well, these are the topics of the era. And maybe part of the reason why you tuned in today. And although I am a professor at Imperial, I'm very proud of my university, but I actually think there are a thousand good universities out there. Um, you, know, it's, uh, you can get excellent education and excellent experience, at very diverse institutions around the world. So absolutely um, worthwhile pushing on your studies and engaging in lifelong learning. But above all, implement what you've learnt. So you know, if you've engaged and are excited about sustainability, well, do your bit throughout your career. Of course, you've got a long time to do that, 40, 45 years. And as you can see, I wear a number of hats. I boast about my university to an extent, um, Imperial College London, very proud of having been associated and working in a school within that university, the Dyson School of Design and Engineering, very proud to be involved in the Energy Futures Lab. But I'm also chairman of the board of QBot Limited, chairman of the board, chairperson of the board of Bladebug Limited. So if you're interested in these companies, you can check out QBot from the QR code there. And this particular company does require robotic engineers, needs coders and software engineers, needs mechanical engineers, it needs sustainability experts. It needs people engaged in business development. So if you're interested, check out those two links. But there are many companies doing good out there. So you know, check out diverse companies and then uh, uh, align yourself as you deem fit. So I'm just going to finish with this statement. We live in a challenging and changing world. Well, you don't need me to tell you this. But I had the privilege of engaging with the organisers for today's event and looking up this organisation. And I've got an impression of the type of people involved. And sometimes I can speak to audiences and just ask this question, are you just going to be the victims of change and subject to change? Well, that's not your pathway. The pathway that you're engaged in by engaging in events like this and your own development is that you are determined to be suppliers of change. And I just encourage you, please uh, keep up your spirits, keep up your ongoing efforts in this regard in terms of supplying change for our very needy world. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.